Uh, okay, so I think uh, I think we'll get started, and then uh, as people pop in, I'll just I'll just let them in. Um, so for those of you who haven't met me, uh, my name is Phil Jazak. I'm the membership and communications manager here at the New Hampshire Home Builders, um, and we are doing this class today, courtesy of New Hampshire Saves, <laughs> with uh, our friend Tony from Blue Lion. Uh, Blue Lion has been a member with us for about three years now. Um, they're always involved. They're really great. Um, Tony and unfortunately Allison isn't here, um, but the two of them are quite the powerhouse team. They're always uh, they're always involved and uh, always are doing great things with us and things without us as well with charity and all that. Um, but they're also pretty good at what they do from what I hear. So um, Tony's going to be here and and uh, teach you some things about HR that I have no idea about. Um, Tony, I'm gonna um, mute myself and let you take over, but I'll be here if you uh, if you need to share your screen or anything like that. You got it, all right. So let me see if I have the power to share. I do, okay. awesome. All righty, um, can you see my screen? Oh, you just give me a, yes, it works. Yep, you're all good. Okay, awesome, great. Um, so welcome to Navigating the DOL Independent Contractor Final Rule. We love the government here at Blue Lion, and I'm sure all of our friends at uh, the <laughs> New Hampshire Home Builder Association also feel the same way, with them changing regulations on us all the time and just trying to make our lives so much easier on the day-to-day. Um, I do have Phil recording this uh, so that if there's stuff that you want to capture after the fact, I think um, he could send it to you if you requested, because sometimes I go over a lot of information and I talk a little fast. I like it if it can be interactive. So um, if I do go over something, you're like, Tony, what the hell does that mean? Please feel free to stop me and I'll break it down or I'll give a different kind of example or you can give an example and I can generally say what I sort of feel overall. Um, I do have to say by law that I'm not an attorney. Although I will say I can research just as good as one, but I can't give you any legal advice, but I can generally support you through the process. Um, as Phil said, we have been part of the New Hampshire Home Builders Association for a little over three years, myself and my business partner, Allison. She's the blonde one. You might see running around everywhere, volunteering and everything um, known to mankind. Um, I try to be a little bit more in the background, but we both co-founded Blue Lion um, about six years ago, and we own and operate this remote HR company that supports you guys wherever you are. We can come on site. We call it butts and seats um, or, or virtually, which is cool. I've worked in blue collar. I was also raised by a blue collar father. My husband's blue collar. Um, so, so the good thing is I know your plight. I know your struggle. And I'm also your resident conspiracy theorist. So I secretly just dislike the government and everything they try and do to us. But here we go. Here's our agenda for the day. Um, we are going to talk about the updated rule. We're going to talk about what the hell it updated from because there was something prior um, what an independent contractor is generally by title, what an employee is, uh, the updated six factor authentication and what that means. We're going to go through all six for the, for the federal government. Fun fact, New Hampshire has its own test. There's seven, uh, qualifications for them. And then why wouldn't the IRS have their own test? And there's this 20 uh, point questionnaire. Um, and then what's really the risk of misclassifying? Uh, at the end of the day, you will see pretty consistent themes through all three tests, through the federal test, through the state test, and through the IRS test. But each one does a good and sometimes a bad job of really nailing down that nitty gritty. So what was the final rule? So in January of 2024, uh, essentially the Federal Department of Labor said that they are going to essentially not necessarily repeal because it's not a law, but go back to the 2021 rule and wash it. So independent contractor rules switch all the time um, on the severity and the level in which it gets viewed at on the federal level. The reason for that is because depending on which president is inside the White House, generally they hire a new person as the head of the Department of Labor, and then they decide to make different rules, whether it's kind of employer favorable or employee favorable. And so it kind of goes back and forth, and it's a super annoying volley overall. They do 
generally, I believe, have a good intent to try and essentially make it so that employees or people, individuals, independent contractors are not being taken advantage of. OK, so at the end of the day, the rule and the mentality is instead of, you know, every Joe Schmo being able to walk up to you and say, yeah, I can be an independent contractor and you as the employer thinking, great, like I'm saving on overtime, I'm saving on um taxes, I'm saving on workers' comp, I'm saving on benefits, I'm saving on risk, I'm saving on additional insurances. Um, it says, okay, yes, you can do all those things if it's truthfully that kind of an arrangement and a relationship. Instead of Joe Schmo, and I'm going to use that name, coming into work, he's really not an independent contractor. He should be an employee. He gets hurt. He hasn't been paying taxes. He hasn't been paying into anything. He can't cover short-term disability for himself. And essentially, he's up the creek, not a power. All right, when he should have been a W-2 employee. So essentially the rule says we're going to go back to what the rule was before January of 2021. And again, if you think about it, this, this generally does follow cycles of the changeover or through election time. Um, and instead of doing what we're going to show next is kind of a three-pronged factor test where there's an evaluation of weight meaning some things on the factor are more important than others. We're going to go back and say all six things. We're going to use this thing called an, an economic test, the reality of the economic test. And not one thing is really more important than the other. We want to look at it as a whole. We want to see the whole puzzle. You know, we don't think the outside's the most important or the inside's the most important, but the corners are the most important. The whole thing really needs to kind of jive. So that was the intent. So what did 2021 say? So 21 um, basically said that the version sought to elevate two main factors. Okay. And those, these are the following two, the nature and degree of control. And I am going to go over the definition of what that means. Cause some people are like, well, what, who defines the nature and degree of control um, over the relevant work? What are they doing? And an individual's opportunity for profit or loss. So even though there's additional things we're going to go over, you'll see next, those are the two heaviest things that existed before. So if these two things were not a big deal, you're like, oh, you know, the nature and degree of control on the employer, I decide what the person does all the time. That's going to independent automatically say, nope, they should be a W-2. If the second thing is they, you get to dictate how much you're paying to them. They have no real negotiation power. Boop, it doesn't matter about the next items we talk about. Automatically, they're going to assume those two things are heavy, heavy balls in the court bang, they moved into the W-2 versus the contractor or the IC. Then they evaluated the other smaller things, the amount of skill required to perform the work. They evaluated the degree of performance of the relationship. That means, do I get to just leave? Do I say our contract's up? Do you get to fire me? Um, and whether the work is part of an integral unit of what you do. All right. So this way of looking at it kind of evaluated some things are more important than the other. The new way of values, all of them are going to be friends together. Doesn't matter. Not one person is going to elevate against the next. Did someone have a question? Okay, cool. So what do you do now, right? Employee or independent contractor, you're sweating, getting it wrong, could cost you. We'll talk a little bit about that, but let's talk about the difference between the two things. An independent contractor, a true independent contractor, when we think about them, is somebody who really is running their own operation of business, okay? These are not people that are just coming into your shop or your business every single day. They're working multiple jobs. They're working multiple clients. They're maybe short standing with you for one project, and then they're working another project. They decide when they take their own vacations, they're just going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take this job or not take a job. It's not mandated. So if you think about an employee who's supposed to show up to your job every day at 7, 8, 39, whatever time it is, and the independent contractor decides when they show up, you say, I need you to paint this job. And they say, OK, great. And you're like, I need it done by you can give deadlines, of course, because you also are a company. But you can say, I need it done by Friday. And they say, great. Well, maybe you want it done Monday, but they have another job on Monday. So they're going to come in on Tuesday or Wednesday or maybe they're going to come in Thursday. As long as they're meeting the requirements of the arrangement you've set with them, you don't get to dictate whether or not they come in or not and what time. Additionally, on financial sides, if you have an independent contractor and you're paying them $600 or more a year, your tax accountant um, should be sending out them a 1099 MISC. So that's the other piece. So independent contractor, people call it the IC, independent contractor, they call it contractors, they call them um, 
1099s. It's all the same thing. All those people are the same thing. Okay. It's just a definition between, they call them 1099, which is an IRS document, independent contractors, what the Fair Labor Standards Act calls it. Um, but they're all the same thing. So you don't only have to be doing the other stuff. You also have to be giving them documentation under the IRS because they're supposed to be claiming that money and they're supposed to be paying taxes, whether it's independent tax, meaning they're covering the social and media on themselves and themselves as the employer, federal income tax, all that kind of stuff. So that's what that 1099 MISC is. It's the form of the IRS saying, yep, I hired Tony. She came in, she did a job for me. I gave her, to, you know, $2,000. And then I have to say on my taxes, yep, you know, X, Y, and Z hired me. They paid me $2,000. So it's it's really about that piece as well. An employee is honestly everybody else. At the end of the day, the takeaway that you can kind of take from this training is this. You will never be in trouble for classifying somebody as an employee. You just won't for a multitude of reasons. One, the part, Department of Labor is never going to come after you because the person will fall under their purview. So you will have to follow certain regulations. They're not going to say, well, you should have been paying them a contract or you shouldn't have been covering them under workers' comp. They don't care. That's it's 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 the more safe version is making somebody a W-2. It just is. It just is. Even if somebody does have their own business, you could W-2 them, have them be real employees, and you would not be in danger of that. And the reason I say that is because you're following all the other rules. You're paying taxes on their behalf. You're covering them under the workers' comp. If you have benefits, they could be eligible to take or waive the benefits. You're able to classify and require them to come into work or leave work or do other things. It's the risk of the misclassifying the contractor that weighs heavily on employers and comes down to the dollars and cents when a lawsuit happens. That's what the IRS is going to come after you for because Tony didn't claim the $2,000 on her taxes and she should have been an employee and you should have been putting in 7 point whatever percent on a social and Medicare tax percentage for them. And you should have been giving the federal government however much percent of federal income tax. And then unemployment's going to want their piece of the pie. So that's what people get slammed for is because all the agencies that want to put their hands in the pockets, quite honestly, are not getting it. So they're saying, you should have done this. We didn't get it. And the person was not a real independent contractor, so they didn't pay anything. And then the employer is going to get slammed. The employee is not going to get in trouble. They might owe back taxes here and there. But other than that, no one's going to go to jail for that. No one's business is going to get shut down. Um, so just paying attention one way is a lot safer than the other. So what's the new regulation? It is a six-factor analysis looking at the entirety of the economic impact without having any predetermined weight to one thing or another. That's the shift. So at the end of the day, the items didn't change. These six items were very similar items to the 2021 rule. It just decides we're not going to say one thing is more important than the other. That's the biggest thing. So if you've been operating off of these six items already, they shouldn't really be new to you. There might just be information to you that you're like, okay, so I care a little bit. Uh, uh, maybe now I can care a little bit more about other stuff as the whole of when I'm looking at somebody whether or not they should be an independent contractor or not. And we are going to define exactly what these items mean. And the first one that we're going to define, and these next six are not in any particular order. It's important to say that because one does not weigh more than the next. They're just numbered sequentially, is the opportunity for profit and loss. Okay. Uh, ooh, sorry, I jumped real quick. So the opportunity for profit and loss. So how a worker workers managerial skill impacts their economic success. So as the independent contractor, do I get to come in and say, my rate is $200 an hour, my rate is $60 an hour, or this job is going to cost you $2,000, this job is going to cost you $800. Am I being the person who gets to negotiate? It doesn't necessarily have to be me who decides the final decision. It is a conversation though. And some people might say, well, I've tried hiring people in the last three years and I want to bring them in at $15 an hour and they want to get coming in at $30 an hour. That's negotiation. Doesn't that count, Tony? Yes, absolutely it does. But then there's the next pieces that go into the opportunity for profit or loss. As an independent contractor, I also get to engage in marketing and advertising of my business to try and get more business. I should not be operating with just one business who is feeding me money and jobs all the time. I should have a multitude of organizations supporting me and me supporting them. 
So do I engage in marketing and advertising? Am I on social media? Am I had, do I have a website that's telling people what I do? Am I printing flyers? Am I networking at New Hampshire home builder events? These are things that are going to impact whether I get more business or not. Right. Because if I'm doing that, if I'm an employee, I don't need to have another job. Maybe I do, but I don't need to. I go to work 40 hours a week, maybe more, and I go home. I don't need to go around saying, hey, you should hire me to do your job as well. And I'll work another 40 hours a week. The likelihood of that is not necessarily very good. As an independent contractor, I have the right to accept and reject jobs as well. So if you're telling me on Monday, let's say that I'm a, a handyman. Okay, and you're telling me, hey, Monday, um, I need you to go in and do some, you know, hang some sheetrock, maybe do some painting, also lay out some trim board. Um, while you're in there, can you also hang a microwave? And I can say, oh, you know what, I'll go in and I'll do the sheetrock, but I'm not doing any trim board, I'm not hanging a microwave. I get the right to decide that. You as the, as the other end, right, the employer making the decision, you then get to say, well, then the job's not yours. Okay, that's my opportunity to lose money as an independent contractor. And you still get the negotiating power to say, well, I need to do all or nothing. I get to say, all right, well, then I'll take all or then I'll take nothing. Or we can negotiate that I'll take some. That's the negotiation part of accepting and rejecting jobs. As an independent contractor, I also should have the right to hire people if I want. No employee is going to be able to say, you know what, boss, um, I've decided to hire myself an assistant so that I can take lunch um, for two hours every single day. They're gonna be answering my emails for me. Uh, I've put them on our payroll. Of course not, that, may, that would make no sense. But as an independent contractor, I can say, hey, yeah, you know, I have so many jobs going on. I've hired a couple extra guys, so it's actually not gonna be me doing that paint job. I'm gonna hire Bill, he's gonna come on over. He's gonna do that paint job for you. I've hired somebody to do that work. Purchasing material. This in your industry can be a little bit uh, gray matter, and here's why. Oftentimes, you might hire somebody to come do a job and the material's already there, but they're subbing out specific aspects. Or you put it into the thing that you're like, yeah, I've purchased the sheetrock, but I need you to come hang it. And then maybe their job is to do the taping, mudding, and making sure that they bring that part of the material. So it does depend, but for white collar companies, think about things like, you know, my team at Blue Lion, I would never expect an employer to purchase them a computer. The iPod, I pay for the computers, I pay for their monitors, I pay for their setup at home. I'm purchasing the materials needed in order for them to do the job. Do I have the opportunity or the need to rent space? You know, I shouldn't necessarily be having a fixated space in your, in your location or your office where I sit down and I work every single day, okay? I have the opportunity to rent space, whether it's storage space, whether it's office space, whether it's whatever the heck I want, a place to go and watch movies all day while I'm having my employees do their jobs. So it's the opportunity for how I'm going to end my year. Am I going to be profitable or am I going to be not profitable? That is the deciding factor for this particular piece. So if a worker has no opportunity for a profit or loss, likely they are going to be an employee. Okay. Next is nature and degree of control. So what I did for this slide is I basically said, if the answer to most of these is yes, then you probably have an employee on your hands for this one versus an employee uh, versus a contractor. So as the employer, do you set the work schedule? Do you say, I expect you to work for us Monday through Friday, eight to five or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, two to six. If you're setting the schedule and I don't get to decide, well, that could impact my ability to take other jobs. So, <laughs> so I don't necessarily have the degree and control of making those schedules. Now, there are times that this can be a discussion and this can be a ebb and flow. Here's a great example. At Blue Riot, we go on site for clients. So they'll want us on site maybe once a week, once a month, once a quarter. The conversation can say, I need you to be on site on a Tuesday because that's when my whole staff will be here. Or I need you to be on site at, at 7 a.m. because we're a landscaping company and all our guys head out by 7.30 or 8. So I want them to be able to get 30 minutes to an hour with you before they launch to jobs. That's a discussion and that's fine. But it's an ebb and flow. You can't necessarily just dictate right away and I have to be there. That's an employee relationship. Does the employer limit the person's ability to work with others, including competition? I should be able, if you're a construction company, I can work with you, I can work with your competitor. If you're a landscaper, I can work with you, I can work with your competitors. You can't limit me the way you do employees, which you can do. I know a lot of people, there's been a lot of 
discussion because of the recent, again, regulation, um, having to do with non-competes. Well, non-competes are important for an employee who's terminated, but you absolutely can limit an internal employee's ability to work for competitors, just FYI. But you can't limit an independent contractor's ability to work with competition. You can have them sign non-solicits. You can have them sign non-disclosures or confidentiality, saying they're not going to bring that information somewhere else. But they have to have the ability to work with other people because generally what they're doing is probably something that is offered to multiple people in your industry. Does the employer use technological means to supervise the performance of the work? Again, this is not necessarily a one or all, but how are you tracking if the work's getting done? This is more for a little bit white collar than it is really the blue collar, but it's like, am I putting some kind of tracking system on your computer system? Am I putting a GPS monitor inside your truck? your personal vehicle to see that you've gotten to the job site at a certain time you've left or that you're commuting on our behalf to one place to another. That's a technological way of supervising performance of work. And then does the employer reserve the right to supervise and discipline the workers? So if it's not just me on site, maybe there's three or four other people on my team, do you have the right to go to those people and say, hey, you screwed up this job or, hey, you made a mistake? Or do you have to come to me because I'm the person on site that works for the organization? Or do you have to go to our boss and say, hey, listen, Tony was on site today. She made a mistake. You would discipline an employee in real time, I hope. You would have to go to another organization to make a complaint, right? Think about when the UPS drive drops things off and makes mistakes or Amazon drops things off and makes mistakes. We are complaining and yelling and, and well, maybe we are, but reaming out the UPS driver, the Amazon driver, right? We make a message over to Amazon, we make a message to UPS, we make a complaint, we put in the process. You know, that worker is going to get yelled at by their person because that's the person who oversees the control of their work. Next is degree of performance, which I misspelled. Um, where the work relationship is definite, uh, definite to duration. Okay. That's length of time, non-exclusive, meaning I can work for you. We've talked about this a little bit and somebody else. Is it project-based? So I can take on something small or I can take on something large. I'm not there every single day all the time or sporadic based on the worker being in business for himself and marketing their services or labor to multiple entities. All right. So that's my degree of performance. This is a factor it doesn't weigh any more or less than the rest, but it generally does weigh heavily, I would say for you saying there is a good chance that they're a contractor. If the answer to this one is yes. Yeah, they work for a bunch of different organizations. Yeah, they decide when they come in and they leave. Yep, they only work on this particular kind of work for us. Very good chance they're independent contractors. Contrarily, however, if the work relationship is indefinite in duration, they have to be there forever, it's exclusive, they can't work for other people, it's going to weigh in the opposite factor, okay? It's important, that, um, and I put it in here, that seasonal or temporary work uh, does not necessarily favor classification as an independent contractor. So just because you might, for example, let's say you're landscaping, you have a green season and a white season during, you know, snow, maybe you hire a couple additional um, people for the season that are going to be doing plowing or snow removal, you wouldn't necessarily just automatically assume that they're independent contractors. Now, could you hire a couple of guys or girls, of course, that are coming in and they have their own truck, they do plying for other people, you maybe give them one or two locations, um, they dictate a, a couple of other things for the, for the work? Yeah, of course, absolutely. That would potentially be an independent contractor because I I have the definition of saying whether or not I'm going to make money, I'm going to take this job. I get to decide whether or not I hire additional people. Am I going to have somebody else in my truck with me because I'm working long hours at night? It's normally when plowing happens. You know, those things do happen, but don't just assume, okay, well, I have seasonal workers. They're going to be 1099 contractors. That's not necessarily because of the timing automatically going to get you the accuracy. Is what this person or people are doing an integral part of your organization and what you do as a business? If the work that's being performed is critical and central to your principal business, there's a good chance that the person should probably be considered an employee and not a contractor. But if the work performed is not critical or necessary, this factor could weigh toward the work being an independent contractor. So think about a general contractor um, who comes to your house and say, and you say, hey, listen, you know, I need to do a bathroom remodel. Okay, well, their job is being a GC and the bathroom remodel could 
take a bunch of different things. You need flooring, you need plumber, electrician, you need um, a carpenter, you need to be filing for permits, all that kind of stuff. So as a GC, my job is to either, maybe I have companies that do all those things, maybe I have employees that do all those things, or I have to vet out independent contractors. I have to vet out other businesses. Hey, Bill, I have a, I have a job coming up. You know, uh, they need this amount of work. What's it going to cost me to do this? And I loop all that into my end cost to the end user, the person who's, whose bathroom is getting updated. Okay. But is each one of those aspects integral to the GC's job? Yes, but not always. Maybe he takes a job that just isn't, a, maybe it's a flooring job. I take this GC job. I, I get you a floor. Okay, great. Well, next week's job maybe is um, a rebuild. So I need to hire somebody to come do framing. I need to have somebody come do insulation. And so I, my job is to have all these different people working for me. And if I'm doing it the right way, it should be fine. But if I have the same guy, maybe I have guys that go to the jobs that are checking and make sure everything is working the way it's supposed to. Well, can that person really be an independent contractor? Can my site foreman really be an independent contractor? Probably not. Because you're saying these are the jobs I need you to check up on. I need you to make sure these things are happening. I need you to do X, Y, and Z. You're dictating that work to them. And that is integral to you being successful because you can't maybe run five, six, 10, 15 jobs simultaneously. You need to hire somebody to help you with that. So again, this is the change from the 2021 regulation to now is before this weighed less than the opportunity of cost loss or, or profit gain. Where now all six of the things we're talking about are really weighed equally and more viewed as a whole. Wow, I must have been drunk when I finished some of these. Um, skills and initiative is the word it's supposed to be. Um, when reviewing the skills and initiative factor uh, of the worker needing the training, is there specialized skill needed to perform the work? And are you the person giving that person that skill? So here's a great thing. For example, a lot of tech companies do independent contractors. They'll hire other people to come in and do coding. Now, is coding an integral part of their job? An integral part of what that organization does? Absolutely. If you're selling software, you absolutely on box four would probably be an employee. But the skills and initiative need in order to do this job, you probably come with, right? If you're Apple, you're not hiring somebody and training them from scratch on how to code. You have to have some kind of skill in order to do that work. Well, same for other things. I can't just hire somebody in and say, oh, you're going to be a plumber and you have no plumbing experience. Like you need to have, you know, some organization, you know, electric, plumbing and things like that, HVAC. Those need to be licensed. You need to have certificate certifications, licensing, gas, like all sorts of stuff in order to do that job. So you need to hire somebody with that skill in order to do it. You're not training them. Now, maybe you are hiring somebody who doesn't have the skill and they're apprentices or they're going to be job helpers or whatever that may look like. They should be w 2 would all right? Because they're coming in unskilled and you're giving them the training that's necessary. I just like memes in my training because training can be boring. All right. So the sixth one is investments by the worker and the potential employer. So the employer should consider whether the worker, the independent contractor, the W-2, whatever it is, their investments are capital or entrepreneurial. So what's the difference between that is kind of below. So whether they support an independent business and serve a, uh, and serve a business-like function, such as increasing the worker's ability to perform different types of work, reducing cost or extending market reach, and how they compare relative to the employee's investment in the overall business. So let's go back to the, pl uh, to the plumber, for example, or to the uh, guy who's doing the plowing. Well, am I giving you a truck to do plowing? Or did you come with your truck that already has a plow on it? That's investment. That's capital. I've paid for something. It's, di it's diminishing over time if your tax accountant is doing what they're supposed to be doing. But I've paid for that item. You haven't given it to me. I don't have to give it back to you at the end of the season. It's mine. I take it with me. The market reach. Am I the person who's paying for marketing? Am I putting different things out on social media? Am I paying for things to be printed? Am I paying for commercials? Are you able to reduce my cost? Well, how would you do that if I was truthfully an independent contractor? So costs that are incurred by a worker for tools and equipment to perform a specific job 
um, of workers' labor. That's potential that an employer poses unilaterally on the worker. So sometimes I've seen organizations that say, well, you need to be able to come and do the job with your own tools. You have to be careful on what you're saying and how you're doing that. You potentially could request that anybody who works for you has their own tools as a reduction of what the company has to incur. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you can't necessarily hard and fast make that statement without having some potential risk, both to the economic cost of the employee and the federal government and state government, especially New Hampshire frowns a little bit upon that. Think about things like uniforms. You can't require employees to pay for uniforms. Um, it's just one of those things. So what's the investment by the worker and the employer? So again, I'll talk about the lion. Our investment is we buy laptops, we buy computer monitors, mouses, you know, keyboards, um, digital cameras for people's computers. You know, those are the things that we as an employer are investing in. We don't ask our, our clients to pay for those things, of course, because that's our investment in our workers. But if they were contractors, they would be responsible for setting up their own systems. So the investment is the money by the worker and the potential employer who's really holding the burden of that capital. Any questions? Because now we're going to jump into the New Hampshire version of the regulations. And different states do have different versions and they are sometimes more stringent or less stringent. Um, Mass has their own test. California has their own test, of course. So everybody, not all states do. Not all states do have their own regulations, but some definitely do. Um, Alice, yeah, I got a or, question. Sorry, Tony. Yep, Matt yeah. had a question. Yeah, so the question Matt uh, jumped into the chat said, would a uniform be if an employer says white shirt, black pants? No, um, as long as you're not dictating where that white shirt and black pants come from, and as long as you're not dictating... Um, like you can't also dictate super hyper specific things. So here's an example. We just had a, an employer we dealt with who was like, um, they need to have white shirts that button down top collar. They also need to have gold buttons and they need to have a very specific cuff. Okay, you're 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 building a uniform. Like you you have to be able to have a lot of wiggle room on what you can and can't say and what you can and can't do with the uniform. Um, so yes, white, white shirt, black pants. I think about restaurant industries a lot require those kinds of things. No, those are not uniforms. Other questions. Okay, cool. So here's New Hampshire seven point test. Um, it's going to be two slides for you. So, and because a lot of it is very similar, I, I just kind of dropped it in this way. So the individual possesses or has applied for a federal employer ID number. So the government basically want New Hampshire wants you to be able to be paying your taxes with a federal employer ID number or your social security. Um, so that's the first thing. The second is the individual has control and discretion over the means and manner of the performance of the work and that the result of the work rather than the means or the manner by which the work is performed is a primary element bargaining for by the employer. So that means I get to decide how the work gets done the end result can be agreed upon by both of us, but you don't, it's, it's the end result, not the journey for the state of New Hampshire, okay? So if I want a hand brush when I'm painting versus using a roller, I get to do that. The individual has control over the time when the work is performed, so we talked about that as well. Do you, you know, for the federal government, do I get to dictate when I do the work or am I going to be held to very specific requirements under certain scheduling for the employer? Um, yes, so that's, again, schedule of, of, of the organization as a whole, all of that's there. The next one is the individual hires and pays for individual um, assistance. We talked about the ability to hire. That's not different from the federal government. Uh, if they have that opportunity, the individual holds himself or herself out to be in business for himself or herself or is registered with the state as a business. So this is, again, I'm I'm putting myself out there, the ability to market, the ability to take other jobs on. The individual is responsible for satisfactory completion of work and may be held contractually responsible for failure to complete the work. So think about an employee. An employee, I come to work, I do a bad job. Um, you know, I come to work and I don't do the job. Well, if I'm hourly or salary, that you know, whatever, you can fire me, but you can't say, I'm not going to pay you for your work today. You came into work, you were here for four hours. Uh, I'm not going to pay you because you didn't do a good job. Where 
an independent contractor, they can come and they can do a bad job. And you can say, I'm not paying you on this contract. You didn't follow through or you cost me money. Like I've definitely seen GC jobs where it's like one person comes in and if you have a lot of different people working, let's go back to the example of a bathroom remodel, the floors get done. Well, then the plumber comes in and he's cutting things, moving things around. He scrapes the floor up. Okay. Well, he's, who's going to pay for that, that to get repaired? The plumber, you may have, you should have been paying attention. You should have been paying more attention, covered the floor, done whatever. So that is definitely a discussion and an argument that these two people can have. And then the individual is not required to work exclusively for the employer. Very similar, again, to the federal government. So the federal government has six. New Hampshire has seven. Essentially, they're just breaking one down a little bit more in detail um, to be able to work for multiple people. So New Hampshire federal government, pretty close together um, if you have any issues. New Hampshire used to have, a, I think it was 12-point questionnaire. Um, it was nice that they drilled it down to seven, which is good, especially because our next one that we're going to go over is the IRS. Iris has 20, but they really, the 20 is really more of like a, it's not so much, I would say, based on these high level things, they really just make it very question and answer prone. So it's a little bit easier for you to say yes or no, these people, yes or no, do these particular aspects to kind of hone in a little bit tighter on how the IRS sees it. So that's the New Hampshire regulations. There's seven versus six of the federal government. New Hampshire has been pretty steady all along. Um, they just drilled down, which means they took some of the other things away because they felt like it was redundant, to be quite honest. Questions on the state of New Hampshire? So next is the IRS. And of course, they have their own regulations as well. So the IRS characteristics, um, they view it in three huge functions. So behavioral control, we already know about this, whether or not the company has the right to direct control, how the work is done through instructions, training, and other means. Financial control, whether or not the company has the right to direct or control the financial and business aspects. And the relationship how the worker and business owner perceive their relationship. So these are the three main characteristics that the IRS breaks it down. These are the three big ways that they look at it. And then they break it down into kind of a 20 point questionnaire to kind of help you hone it. Um, I always say, print, like go to the IRS website, look at these 20 things, print it off, write yes or no next to it. If you are answering yes or no on the IRS level, there's a really good for chance that you're probably qualifying them correctly on both the state and federal level, okay? But all three are operated by different organizations. So the, the first one I went over is by the Federal Department of Labor, FLSA, Fair Labor Standard Act. The second is through the New Hampshire Department of Labor. That's the organization that cares about what they do. That's the one that would come after you for misclassification. And this is the IRS. All three organizations absolutely can slam me for misclassification, meaning you could have compounded issues by misclassifying one employee by all three organizations. It's not ideal. So let's talk about the 20 questions, essentially. They're not as fun as, as the game you played back in high school or college. So the first is profit or loss. Can the worker make a profit or suffer a loss because of the work aside from the money earned from the project? So this is really involved in that economic risk, not just the risk of getting paid, okay? I can work with a crappy guy who's not going to pay me. That's not my ability to make profit or loss. It's can I decide the jobs that I'm taking? Next is investment. Again, this is one we know. Does the worker have an investment in the equipment and the facilities used to do the work? The greater the investment, the more likely they're an independent contractor, okay? The more money they're spending on themselves and their business or their employees, the more likely they truthfully are independent contractors. I would tell you, if you're working with a business that has other employees at it, so like I, for example, we have 15 staff members working for us, I would a thousand percent suggest that when you're bringing that organization on to do independent contractor work, you're asking for a certificate of insurance. Let me ensure on my side that you are protected as a business and that you're protecting your staff and that you're following legal requirements in the state and federal government. The work uh, works for more than one firm. Does the person work for more than one company at a time? All right. This tends to indicate the independent contractor as well, but it's not conclusive. 
as we've talked about, since employees can also work for more than one job. So, uh, but generally not in the same industry. So in the daytime, I could work HVAC at night. I could maybe do, um, I could moonlight and be doing, you know, different kinds of construction work or I could do overnight paving. All right. So yes, I have two jobs, but the jobs I'm doing are not in tandem or simultaneous to the type of work that I do. But I could be a server in the day at one restaurant. Maybe I work one place that does breakfast and then I'm a server at night. Those are two jobs. They're absolutely similar jobs. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm an independent contractor at either because I'm doing the same amount of work. Services offered to the general public. Do I offer my services to other people, other businesses? Um, general public is in quotes because sometimes people are like, well, you know, if you're a, depending on the work you're doing, if I'm a software engineer, for example, I'm not offering my coding skills to Tony at her house to do work, but I'm offering it to Tony's software business to do that work. So general public is in quotes because the federal government and the IRS uses terminology with. Next is instructions. Do you have the right to give the worker instructions about when and where and how the job is getting done? If the answer is yes, chances are good it's more on the worker side. Next is training. Do you train the worker to do the job in a particular way? So independent contractors should be coming already knowing that skill and ability. So that goes back to the state and the federal side where it's like skills and the initiative. Do I already have the skill to do this job? You shouldn't have to train me on how to do a job if you're hiring me and my business is operated off of me doing that work. Integration. Are the workers' services so important to your business that they have become a necessary part of the business? This may show that the worker is subject to the employer's control. Um, here's the other risk I tell people. So here's where I see it mostly. So think about, for example, a home health agency. A very important part of their job is to send caseworkers, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists um, into home for in-home care. So that is their job. That is what they focus. That is what they are doing. Well, what if I hire a physical therapist that's an independent contractor? That's an integral part of my job. Absolutely. Could it be an independent contractor? Potentially. It has to do with a lot of the other factors. It, just like in the, uh, the new 6.1 with the federal government, the 20.1 with the IRS, it's not a one deciding picks all. It's not, okay, well, you know, everything is good, except I do have to train them on how to use certain software. So I guess they're not an independent contractor. Again, it's about looking at everything all together. All right. And the weight of everything all together. The best thing to reduce your potential liability is to utilize these questionnaires and to say, yes, no, I'm not sure. And then take a look. Are most of them yeses or most of them no's? And then defining and putting that in the employee file. Because if you do get slammed or you get audited by whether it's the federal department, the state department or the IRS, will you necessarily get 100 percent out of trouble because you have them? No because misclassifications are still very real. But is there a chance that you will have a smaller potential civil liability or other kinds of fines and fees? Yeah, there is a chance to that that would happen because you're showing that in good faith, you made an effort to qualify and classify people appropriately and you just maybe didn't understand something or you misread or you overestimated one value versus another. Um, and again, it was looking at that whole. So I like to utilize this when I'm working with different organizations and we say, okay, we're doing an independent contractor test. Let's look at these things. Let's ask these questions. Let's work through it. And we write down why we think it's a yes or no. And we put that in the file when we make the final decision. It is helpful to have these. It shows a record that you are not just operating inadvertently unaware of what's happening in the different departments of, of the government. Services rendered personally. Must the worker provide the services personally as opposed to delegating the task to somebody else. So this is a great example. If I'm an employee, I can't send my sister in that day because I don't feel good to do my job. That's not, you'd be like, what the heck is going on here? There's all sorts of risk for that, right? But if I'm an independent contractor and I'm an electrician and I have another job or I'm injured or I'm sick or I, who knows, I just didn't feel like going to work today, I could send another employee or another worker to do my work. And that would be acceptable. 
Are there sometimes jobs uh, that maybe you're thinking of, well, you know, certain jobs have security risks, so people need to be vetted out? Yes, of course. But usually those jobs can go ahead of time and you vet one or two additional people in the organization in order that if you have to send somebody, you have that opportunity. Next is hiring assistants. We talk about that in the other two as well. Do you have the opportunity to hire, supervise, and pay for workers? If the answer is yes, chances are pretty good you're an independent contractor. If the answer is no, go back to my previous example of, I can't just go to work and say, you know what, there's too much work for me to do. I've decided to hire an assistant and they're gonna be on the payroll. Of course you couldn't do that. What is the continuing relationship? Is there an ongoing relationship between the worker and yourself? The relationship could be considered ongoing depending on the timing of it, okay? Is it frequent or is it irregular? Am I doing one job every couple of months or am I here five days a week, 52 weeks of the year? Next is work hours. So again, they really just, the IRS just breaks it down into super small bites, okay? Work hours, do you set the work hours? Indica independent contractors are masters of their own time. They decide what they're gonna do. Maybe I'm gonna work a 15 hour day so that I have two days off in a week, you know, whatever it is, I get to decide as long as the jobs are getting done and the customers are satisfied. Um, Full-time work, must the worker spend all of his or her time on your job? If they're working 30, 32, 40 hours a week at your job consistently for a long period of time, chances are good they're employees for that particular answer, okay? Work done on premises, must the individual work on your premises or do you control the route or location where the work must be performed? Again, this is a unique one. Answering no doesn't by itself mean that they're that they're an independent contractor status, okay? Because like I said, Blue Line, for example, most of us work at home, but there's times that we have to come on site and do jobs on site. So you define and dictate that, right? The work that needs to be done there. But is it consistently? Absolutely not. Next is sequence. So this is, do you have the right to determine the order in which the services are performed? This goes back to showing control over the worker. What's the control over the worker? Do you have to, do you dictate, okay, well, when you come in, you need to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G in that order. Or do I know, okay, I can come in. I don't really need to do B. I could do B at the end. I'm going to start with C. I'm going to go back to A. I'm going to do G. I'm going to go, you know what I mean? I'm going to decide the sequence of the work. As long as the end result is what we both agreed upon. I didn't break any laws. I didn't break any safety risks, you know, because obviously that that's a whole nother discussion that can be had. But at the end of the day, I decide how the work is getting done. I control as the independent contractor, the work overall. This is a unique one to the IRS, reports. So must the worker give you reports accounting for his or her actions? That potentially could show a lack of independence. If I'm trying to show you reports for everything I've touched or everything I've done, that's usually something you provide to a manager at an employer-employee relationship. If I'm an independent contractor, you're evaluating me based on the end result and the satisfaction not reports. I wouldn't have to show you my employee time cards for everybody who's coming in and out of your job or what I've paid them or, you know what I mean, all of that kind of additional stuff. If you're working white collar, there are sometimes reports that you could be providing, but it really depends um, on what the reports are, are that are being requested by the employer from the independent contractor. Um, but it's one of whole, one of a whole. So we're still talking about 20 questions. Maybe you are requiring reports, but maybe the rest of the questions are leaning more towards that independent contractor status. Next is pay schedules. Do you pay the worker by hour, week or month? Independent contractors are generally paid by the job or commission, although some industry practices, maybe it is hourly. I definitely know some independent contractors depending on their jobs, that do charge by the hour. They charge a very high premium and it, and they don't, and the employer doesn't get to dictate how many hours it's going to take. It takes how many hours it takes in order to get the job done. Uh, but I have seen independent contractors do that. 
You would not necessarily, though, get to define or decide the frequency in which you're paying an independent contractor, and it should never really align with the frequency that you're paying your staff. So if you pay weekly, you probably shouldn't be paying your independent contractor weekly. If you're paying them bi-weekly, you probably shouldn't pay them bi-weekly. It's whatever the agreement inside, hopefully your documented service agreement states. Maybe it's at the end of the job. Maybe it's, you know, half up front, half later, um, whatever that might look like. Maybe it's 100% up front. You know, all those things, the pay schedules should be different. Maybe it's that monthly um, piece there, you know, should be different than what you're paying staff. And of course you are sh and should be paying staff weekly or bi-weekly depending on, on your organization and what you've been requested to do by the federal and state government. So New Hampshire does require you to request if you're going to be paying them outside of, I think, the bi-weekly style. Next is expenses. Do you pay the worker's business or travel cost? This tends to show control. Am I paying for your expenses? Not only does it show control, it also goes back to the ability of the profit and loss. If you aren't having to pay for your own expenses of traveling to the job site, paying for gas, paying for the tools, you know, paying for the tolls, paying meals, you know, maybe I'm there all day and I didn't pack a lunch, I want to be able to go to McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts and get something. That's an employer. Okay, you are making the decision to the employee, hey, I'm covering lunch, it's pizza. An employee has to be paid if they're traveling for work time. They have to, by law. If you have an employee traveling from one job site to another during the work hours, you got to pay them. But an independent contractor, you wouldn't pay. Whenever they show up, wherever they leave, all of that is outlined inside the contract and those expenses are the job and that's the loss potential. Tools and materials. Do you provide the worker with equipment, tools, or materials? This is not new either. We talked about this both at the federal and the state level. Independent contractors generally supply the materials for the job and use their own tools and equipment. There might be one or two things that they use, but overall, probably not, okay? So think about this. If you're hiring somebody who's coming in and you have an excavator on the job site, is that your excavator? Are you hiring them as a as somebody who's just op an operator of the machine? Why would they be an independent contractor for that? Maybe they would be. Chances are good they're probably not, but it's one of those things. The equipment and materials are things that are going to be evaluated as a whole. The right to fire. Can you fire the worker? An independent contractor can't really be fired without subject to the risk of a breach of the contract. So you can't just in the middle of the contract, if everything's going right and there's no breach, generally just say to an independent contractor, you know what? I don't want you to finish this job. I'm not going to pay you for the rest of the job. You'd be in breach of contract. You would have a risk of handling that with a different organization. The Department of Labor wouldn't be involved in that, but usually an attorney would. So paying attention to that is very, very important. Sorry, the screen froze a little bit here. Um, the worker's right to quit. Can the worker quit at any time without incurring liability? Same as the, the right to fire. With an independent contractor, if they leave without the job being done, you could hold them liable. Think about bonds. You know, a lot of organizations, um, depending on who you're engaging with, might require you to do bond work meaning that you have to have a bond to say that if this person walks off the job and you've maybe invested a certain dollar amount into it, usually we see it with municipalities, um, you could hire and pay for somebody else to complete the job. So it's important to pay attention to those kinds of things. Now, right to fire, right to work, usually a lot of people think to themselves, well, New Hampshire is an employment at will state. And you're 100% correct. Almost every state in America is an employment at will state. Not all, but most which means you can terminate and they can quit at whatever frequency or whenever they want without any rhyme or reason. My HR hat will tell me and tell you, please don't just fire somebody without notifying them why. I remind people, although we are a right to work state, you don't then just get to avoid somebody suing you for wrongful termination. Happens all the time. Um, so paying attention to that overall is going to be something that you engage with. So right to work, right to fire, is very different on an employee versus somebody who has a contractual agreement that outlines when you would be able to breach that contract. 
any questions on the federal IRS side of the organization um, and what is and is not defined at that 20 point questionnaire um, overall. Okay, cool. So what? You misclassify somebody. What happens now? Okay. Well, there are absolutely consequences for misclassifying somebody. So if you misclassify a worker who should be W-2, should be getting a paid stub from you as an independent contractor, what's going to happen is, depending on who finds out, they're going to come in and they're going to say, okay, well, you've paid them, you know, $30,000 over the year. You're going to owe back taxes. Your worker's comp is going to come in. They're going to say that you have to pay back owed worker's comp um, in order to have covered them. The government's going to say you owe back unemployment tax. And then you also could have employer practice liability insurance getting sued because at the end of the day, somebody is going to hold you accountable for not doing the right thing. So the difference between an hourly employee um, or even a salary employee and this person who's an independent contractor is the taxes and the liabilities on the back end as the employer. So that is what is going to happen if they come in. They'll say, oh, this person should be W-2. They it looks like you've been paying them based on all of your tax information for the past two, three, four, who knows how long years. Usually I think they only go back three years. So not that extensive, but the IRS can go back a lot further. Um, you're going to owe back wages on these particular people. That can be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars that can cripple an organization. Or you have to deal with legal going back and forth. If you really believe that they should be an, an independent contractor versus an employee, you're going to be paying legal fees. I have an example of what this potentially looks like. So um, here's an example of a California-based company. So I know we hate California. Just kidding. But some of us mostly do. I'm born there, so I can say it. Um, but they have very crazy laws out there in California. They are a insanely employee um heavy facing regulation state. Anyway, a California based company was charged with misclassifying a group of its employees as independent contractors and it ended up with an $11 million in penalty fees. The company had employees and independent contractors handling many of the exact same tasks, meaning there were two people sitting next to you. One person was an independent contractor. One was an employee. They were doing the same exact thing. Um, and the court found that the company didn't do enough to clearly distinguish between these two positions. All right, here's some other stuff. A task force in New York, another difficult state, but found 20, uh, 2,200 uh, instances of workers treated as independent contractors representing more than $282.5 million in unreported wages. Those business, and that was a multitude of businesses though, and they had to go back. Okay, but think about that. 20,000 employees, a little over 20,000 employees, $282 million. In Connecticut, a 12-month audit, 12 months, 12 months, that's only a year, um, audit reclassified 3,000, almost 3,500 workers and uncovered $68 million in unreported wages. When they say unreported wages, it could be one of two things. One is you didn't report them correctly through the 1099, or two is they're supposed to be W-2 employees, and so the taxes weren't collected. Connecticut is not that far away, y'all. Massachusetts our lovely neighbor down south, identified 5,000, almost 5,500 misclassified workers carrying a total of $46 million of unreported wages. $46 million, 5,500 workers. That math is insane. So it does hurt. It will hurt if we misclassify people. Absolutely, end of day. So what now? Well, the conclusion is independent contractors do have, as we went over, very clear definitions. And the underlying tone across all three organizations, whether it's state, federal, or IRS, is very, very similar, to be honest. They might use a little bit more dialogue than the next or more questions than the next. But at the end of the day, all three of them really do have the same thought on who should and should not be qualified as independent contractors. Okay. So the IRS and the DOL crack down to prevent companies from trying to avoid the financial obligations. That's what they're trying to do. They're saying, okay, businesses are essentially trying to say, oh, no, they're an independent contractor. I don't have to pay them benefits or taxes or workers' comp or any of that stuff. 
And the IRS, the DOL are like, mm, yeah, you do. You know you did, and you've been trying to avoid it. So you've just been misclassifying people here, there, everywhere. Maybe you are in a business and you're trying to hire your very first staff member and you're like, oh, I don't really know what to do. Maybe I'll just bring in a contractor. No, that's not how it works. So you absolutely have to hire them appropriately. And if you're not sure what to do, engage with your in-house HR. If you don't have an in-house HR, you can engage with a consultant like Will Lyon or there's, there's trust me, there's more of us. If you, you're like, I don't want to talk to an HR person, they're the worst. You can talk to an attorney. Not sure how much better they're going to be. You can definitely give it a go. Um, but you want to talk to somebody if you're not sure what to do. Because the consequences absolutely could be costly. Questions? Well, you guys have been really quiet. Either I'm super boring or I'm just really good at what I do and I train so well. Um, just as to FYI, uh, over here at Blue Lion, we do have a fun event coming up in September. If you're interested in learning more, you can find it on our events website. Uh, but if not, you can see it here. It's called WTF is HR because um, we like to curse. And so it's going to be a fun day where we teach about all these different things on the screen. Um, early bird special is gone, so it's 2.49 for the day. We are going to feed you. So if you're interested, please, uh, you can go on the website. You can make that scan. You can uh, reach out to New Hampshire Home Builders. I think they sent a little blast out about it as well. Um, and we'd love to see you there. Any questions? Cool. Well, again, this is our fantastic team. There's lots of us. And if you do want to continue to engage with us, uh, please let us know. We, of course, work all the time with New Hampshire Home Builders. We are also with the Southern New Hampshire Home Builders Association. Um, so we love working with you guys, answering questions, helping, engaging, training. We do free trainings every single month. We work with some amazing partners um, to share on a bunch of different information, but we would love it if you connect with us. And thank you so much to Phil um, for being my backend uh, techie, helping me with all my issues. I know this was supposed to go until 1030, but if there were no questions, that's everything that I have.